This is a, a, another entry in our uh, brown bag seminar with uh, our research fellow Justin Gargan. Uh, Justin is also a, a Fulbright scholar on the Middle East and uh, he's a, a specialist in international law and energy law and uh, hands down the most prolific writer I've ever met. Uh, he, um, he's written over 50 book chapters and articles and uh, is the author of three books, The uh, Dolphin Project, The Development of a Gulf Gas Initiative, um, and uh, a book that's coming up uh, next month uh, called uh, <coughs> The World Trade Organization and Natural Gas, Fuel Pricing in the Gulf, and uh, a very large volume coming out uh, the month after um, called Desert Dreams, The Quest for Gulf Integration from the Arab Revolt to the Gulf Cooperation Council. Uh, Justin, has, uh, Justin specializes in carbon trading, uh, the global oil and gas market, the legal framework surrounding Gulf energy sector, and uh, Middle Eastern geopolitics. He spent uh, <coughs> long periods of time living and traveling in the Gulf and North Africa, speaks uh, fluent Arabic and Spanish, and uh, before coming to Harvard, he studied at Georgetown Law School, or Law Center where uh, his thesis uh, researched the development of a potential carbon trading platform in the Gulf and its impact on foreign direct investment in the um, regional energy sector. He's also published a number of papers through the Dubai Initiative. Uh, they are all available on our website. And I have a few hard copies here for reference. So uh, without further ado, please help me welcome in Justin Morgan. So uh, thank everyone for coming. I appreciate that. And obviously, as, as the title indicates, I'm speaking about resource nationalism from Spanish uh, roots to an Arab tree. I'm going to discuss exactly what I mean uh, by that. But uh, the key issue of resource nationalism, of course, uh, is becoming much more uh, important. Uh, if you look at the last uh, decade, uh, with the increasing rise in the price of uh, the international price of oil, as well with the Arab Spring. So there are a lot of questions as to how many of the oil producing countries are going to deal with some of the stresses and pressures uh, that they face in terms of industrialization, as well as to the popular mobilization uh, that's uh, ongoing within the region. But if we talk about resource nationalism, there are different definitions for this, and it's a bit um, amorphous, you can say, a bit nebulous. I, and I would say it more or less echoes what the U.S. Supreme Court uh, indicated in the 1970s when it tried to come up with a workable definition for obscenity. And one of the justices said, I know when I see it. I mean, so that's more or less how we can consider resource nationalism. But just to give you some basic definitions to uh, round out the contours of this uh, philosophy, it's that uh, if you look at the International Energy Forum, uh, it defines it as nations wanting to make the most of their endowment. Uh, others say that uh, it's a situation where the producer countries uh, want to maximize uh, their future revenue, uh, maximize their revenue from present oil and gas uh, production while altering the terms of investment for future output. And others say that it's part of uh, what is known as the hold up theory. And basically, the hold up theory, or also what is known as the obsolescing bargain, is where once oil is discovered and a significant investment has already sunk in, uh, then the relative bargaining power switches. Uh, between the um, international oil company and you can say IOC and the host country and the host country typically tries to increase the fiscal take uh, by changing the terms of the original contract so after there's been immense sums of capital investment uh, more or less there's nothing that the international oil company can do if the host country decides to change uh, the terms and lastly there's a more geopolitical aspect of this. And uh, the geopolitical aspect states that resource nationalism is more or less an expression of uh, political antipathy uh, to the West and in particular to the U.S. and to a more minor extent the United Kingdom and that uh, it's also against uh, the neoliberal globalization model as well. But today's resource nationalism is quite a different beast than it was in the 1960s and 70s. Uh, the resource nationalism of the 1960s uh, was part and parcel of the ethos of the uh, decolonization struggle in the developing world. But today, if we look at resource nationalism, it's just as likely to precipitate uh, some obscure environmental statutes, such as um, uh, President, then President, now Prime Minister Putin has done, of course, in the settlement field uh, against uh, the Shell investment. Or it could also incorporate the land rights of indigenous tribes in uh, certain remote uh, South African or African oil producing regions, such as what's happened in Ecuador uh, 
uh, against Chevron. So it must be remembered, though, that in the eyes of the participants, that resource nationalism is seen as a battle. So when you look at uh, the oil companies, when you look at the whole states, they see this as a struggle for control uh, between what is perceived to be the national interests and foreign interests. So as such, it does have combatants, uh, it has battlefields, and it has outcomes. And during this lecture, uh, I will raise certain questions as to whom these fighters are. I will talk about why do they fight, where do they fight, what are the battlegrounds, what are their weapons, and I use this in the sense of being ideological weapons or metaphorical weapons, and what have been the results. So there have been several evolutionary, or indeed I could even say revolutionary, uh, factors that have prompted the collapse of the traditional oil market. And we look at the traditional oil market from, let's say, the foundation of it uh, during the late um, uh, 19th century uh, to slightly post-World War II, it was dominated by Western oil companies. And these Western oil companies were known as the Seven Sisters. But after the 1960s, uh, this traditional oil market started to fray at the seams and then eventually collapsed. And the main reasons for that were due to, one, the rapid decolonization that swept over uh, the developed world or the developing world or the colonized world in the wake of World War II. There was also a collaborative effort by oil producing countries to organize and challenge the international oil market. And there was also the rise of the concept of the permanent sovereignty over natural resources. And this was a UN General Assembly resolution in 1962. And basically what it indicated is that natural resources are part and parcel of uh, the host country. So under the very robust uh, uh, sovereignty uh, that these countries are able to do what they want with their natural resources. So this has more or less entered into international law. There's also been a dissatisfaction with the dominant form of the oil contract at that period. And the dominant form of the oil contract was known as the concession contract. And I get into that a bit later, but the concession contract more or less was a franchise which is granted by the host state for an international oil company to explore and produce within that country. But uh, in many uh, in the viewpoint of many host states, they consider this to be uh, a type of colonial contract uh, because um, the host states really didn't have power over the international oil companies and they did not have the control over production in their own countries. So there was a lot of dissatisfaction with this. And then lastly, there was uh, rising oil, global oil demand. And uh, this was connected with what is known as the OECD economic miracle in the 1950s and 60s, which was a period of nearly uninterrupted economic growth. And of course, uh, oil demand ro rose precipitously as well in order to fuel this. So all these factors tied in together, and they fed the growing resource nationalism, uh, which in uh, the Arab states expressed itself in popular opposition uh, in the Arab street uh, against the overwhelming role of the IOCs, the international oil companies within their energy sectors. And it's very easy to forget in this age of the Arab Spring or the Jasmine Revolution or so on, that this period during the 1930s, 40s, 50s, and 60s was a time period of immense social change uh, within Arab countries. And even if we look at the Gulf, there were significant legitimacy challenges which were leveled at the uh, reigning families. And uh, there were so many plots that were ongoing, assassination attempts, popular mobilization, and so on. So I would say that this even, that the current Arab Spring in the Gulf pales in comparison uh, to this, uh, to the political mobilization that occurred during the 1930s, 40s, 50s, and 60s uh, in the Gulf. But while I speak about the specific manifestations of resource nationalism much later, uh, the key ingredient, if we talk about the host countries, is the presumption that the underground resources of the nations or the subsurface minerals, uh, oil, natural gas, and even mining and, and what have you, it forms an integral part of that country, of the territory which is found. And they mean this in nearly every single um, way that you can imagine it. They mean this politically, economically, ideologically, philosophically, culturally, and so on. So just to uh, get into my lecture a bit, and I want to kind of tease out uh, some of the broader ramifications of this, uh, and also give some uh, visualization to what I mean by this. Of course, we all know this proverb that the meek shall inherit the earth. Uh, but uh, this proverb was modified a bit by uh, J. Paul Getty, and he said that they shall inherit the earth, but they won't inherit the mineral, the mineral rights. Now, of course, uh, Getty was uh, the head of uh, Getty Oil Company uh, during the 1960s and 70s, and he more or less has a position that Bill Gates has today. He's one of the wealthiest uh, men uh, at that time period, and extremely powerful. And this obviously indicates the view 
of certain quarters, uh, many uh, international oil companies at that time, that they had a right, an ownership right, to the natural resources. Now what I'd like us to do, I'd just like us to visualize uh, how international power, geopolitical power, wealth, influence is spread across the globe. And one of the best ways to do that is if we look at the international uh, flight path. Okay? Now, if we look at where flights are going, uh, where the majority of people are traveling to, there's a significant correlation with geopolitical power. Now, obviously, you can see from this is that the United States, Western Europe is uh, obviously quite active, in particular the eastern coast of the United States, or the eastern half. And then we also see that some of the BRIC countries, if we look at southwestern China, is particularly active. India is starting to get more active. South Africa, which recently joined the BRICS countries, uh, is quite active, and also Brazil and, and so on. But uh, there are large areas of the world where there is not really that much international traffic. And um, you can say that these areas are more or less, uh, you know, to, just to say bluntly, are the ghettos of the world. I mean, these are areas where there's very little development that's going on. These are areas where there's very little wealth creation or geopolitical influence. Another way to uh, portray this is if we look at the famous Earth lights uh, by the NASA satellites, which indicates energy or electricity usage across the world. Now, you can nearly put one map on top of the other map, and it's, it's, it's nearly coextensive. Of course, the United States, again, the eastern portion in particular, is quite, um, is quite well lit. And then, of course, you have Brazil. Uh, India is becoming uh, much better lit. Uh, Japan, of course, and then uh, Western Europe. But then the large areas of the, the world are, are quite uh, dark. It also indicates that there's very little activity, economic and otherwise, that's going on there. Then we can also consider internet access density. Again, you can put one map nearly on top of the other and you have the same issue that's ongoing. The areas which are much more developed have much more activity that's going on. And still, we should consider this in the rise of China. Well, China is very much in the news today and, of course, a corollary of that is people speak about decoupling of the global economy from uh, the Atlantic Basin. But still, we must consider that most of the economic activity is still ongoing in the Atlantic Basin. Okay, and that still, relatively uh, speaking, there's not as much activity that's ongoing in the BRIC countries. So there's still a lot that they need to catch up with in terms of uh, achieving the wealth, power, and so on that uh, the West has. And then also, here's another, not to beat a dead horse, but still, if we look at internet traffic visualization as well, we see very dense interconnections between the United States, Western Europe, the Atlantic Basin, very little that's ongoing in the southern the southern zone, we could say. And uh, still, if we look at it another way, there's very little connection between the southern countries themselves. So if we look at South America, there's very little South American African traffic, and this also would um, follow uh, economic uh, cooperation and so on and so forth, and very little connection between China, Latin America, and so on. Everything is still tied to the Atlantic Basin, to the global north, to the west. And then there's world LNG trade routes. Now, LNG is liquefied natural gas. So liquefied natural gas is produced in more or less uh, developing countries, and you can see where it's being consumed. It's being consumed more or less in the Western countries, where it's being used for either feeding electricity production or to, as inputs in uh, manufactured products, uh, which are then shipped back to the rest of the world. And then a map of global shipping routes. Again, we can see that the Atlantic Basin is very dense with activity. Uh, and then, of course, there's some that's coming from Brazil, China, and so on. But still, this is the region of the world where the most activity, the most wealth, uh, is concentrated. Now, I'd like to speak uh, quite briefly about uh, Emmanuel uh, Wallerstein. I'm certain that most of you have heard of him. But he developed the concept of world systems analysis. And uh, he split up the world into more or less three zones. One is called the core, the other is called the semi-periphery, and the last is called the periphery. Now, the core is indicated by blue countries. Okay? And this was during the 1980s. This map represents the geographical dispersion of power uh, during that time period. Now, we can see that the western countries are blue, and then the purple countries are countries which are known as the semi-periphery. So these are countries which are more or less the middlemen, and uh, they have taken on low-cost manufacturing and so on, and then they're developing uh, rapidly or slowly as the case may be, and then they ship these products back to the developed world. And then finally we have the periphery, and in the periphery there's very little manufacturing that's ongoing. Mostly what we see in the periphery, which is uh, indicated by the red, is that uh, they are primary product exporting countries. And primary product exporting countries means that they just export raw material, more or less. 
so there's very little manufacturing, little processing of, of even their, uh, their, their, uh, their raw material, their commodities. And uh, basically, they just draw it forth from the ground, and typically it's Western companies, so then they ship it to the developed world. So then we ask the question, we talk about resource nationalism, what do these countries want? What is it they want? What is it they desire uh, when they seek to precipitate increasing control over their natural resources? Well, I, I don't mean to be funny, and this is not a funny situation, but for me it boils down to this, consumption. Okay, and I think that the hamburger symbolizes it all. And the reason why I say this, it's a bit, um, I'm not being ironic at all, but the hamburger actually represents just crass consumption. Okay, and there's no other way to, to, to put it. And uh, the reason why I say this, if you look at the amount of grain, which is uh, utilized to feed one, one cow or to produce one, uh, one pound of meat, or if you look at the deforestation, uh, which is um, connected uh, to the increasing uh, production of, of beef and so on, it's uh, clear that the earth simply cannot sustain that. And it's clear that many of these countries, they want to increase their consumption because, and this is also many people consider this to be overconsumption, but if we look at the VC rates, which are increasing in the developed world, so as soon as these countries start to economically develop, then you start to see obesity rates, which, uh, which increase alongside their economic development as well. So this is something that uh, during my studies and during my travel to the region became quite clear to me, that these countries, they want to become part of the club. They want to become part of the club. They want to have the consumption, the American life, and so on, that they see uh, shown uh, from Hollywood movies and American television and so on. This is truly what they want, and I think that this is the psychological driver behind resource nationalism. So if we ask ourselves some basic questions, uh, just in terms of who is the owner of oil? To whom does it belong to? Is it owned by the farmer or, let's say, the landowner who owns the surface land on which oil was discovered? And in the Anglo-American system, this is known as the law of capture. So more or less that because you have uh, rights to the surface, you own everything underneath the surface as well. And this tends to characterize oil and gas um, resources within the Anglo-American uh, Anglo, uh, countries, so basically countries that adhere to the Anglo legal system. Uh, if land is owned communally, does a commu community own it in common? Or in regards to federalism, does a state or province in which the oil is located have ownership rights? Or do the central authorities of the country have the rights over which is such an important resource? Or lastly, does the IOC, which has invested immense sums, have the ownership rights? So these are all questions that we have to consider when we think about which actor, which entity has rights to subsurface minerals. Actually, I've jumped up a bit, but uh, one thing that I'd like to talk about is that, um, is that much of this, the answer to this question goes back, uh, can be answered historically, or if we look at how certain countries have, have looked at it historically. Uh, the Anglo-Saxon view, which goes back to Roman law, has nearly absolute private ownership of subsurface resources for the property owner. But we have to put this in contrast uh, to the Spanish colonial view. And the Spanish colonial view held that the subsurface minerals uh, were basically part and parcel of the crown, or that they're vested in the crown or the nation. So how did this tension develop between these two theories? And how does contemporary resource nationalism, uh, which is nowadays, or at least during the 60s and 70s, a type of anti-colonial or anti-imperialist philosophy, owe its pedigree to Spanish colonial legal thought? So this is what I'm going to uh, get into at the moment. Uh, now, the father of resource nationalism uh, may be said to be Francisco de Vitoria. And he was a Spanish theologian and jurist in the 16th century. And he developed some of the foundational concepts which related to the prodigious uh, gold and silver uh, deposits that were found in the Americas during the age of discovery. And basically what he wanted to do is he wanted to develop a legal theory which would justify uh, the crown appropriating or expropriating, considering uh, your uh, political stance, uh, these vast reserves of gold and silver which are found in these areas, and basically say that they belong to the Spanish nation or the crown, and they did not belong to the indigenous people of these areas. So although Hugo Grotius is uh, commonly credited with being the father of uh, modern international law, there is an inescapable debt to Di Vittoria. And in colonial Mexico and Latin America, uh, property rights originated 
with the, the Spanish grants that recognizes subsurface minerals as being a portion of the monarch's patrimony uh, that was not granted alongside the surface rights to the land. Uh, so basically this was known as uh, the Partida system. And uh, the mines, gold, silver, and quicksilver, they were so absolutely vested in, uh, in the king that even if the king were to give a land grant, uh, land grant he did not need to ex uh, specifically exempt the subsurface minerals. So that's how entrenched this concept was, that the subsurface minerals actually adhered to the crown. So even if the mines were included uh, in the original land grants, uh, these grants would cease automatically with the death of the king unless the king's successors uh, confirmed these uh, subsurface grants. And even as early as the 18th century, uh, Spanish kings, they would make a legal distinction between precious metals and also hydrocarbons, uh, more or less oil and, uh, and coal. And if we continue further, if we look at uh, Gibo Grotius, or if we look at Samuel Pufendorf, who was a German uh, theorist during this time, legal theorist, they're both influenced by the colonial interests of uh, various European countries. So Grotius, Grotius's theories of property uh, formed the legal framework for colonial appropriation of the territories uh, in America's uh, natural resources. So even though Pufendorf, he left some room for uh, native rights and for the natives to be protected and so on, both legal s scholars argued that, well, God granted the earth to men in common, and I'm sorry, I'm not trying to be gender specific, but that's exactly how they stated it. Uh, mankind did not own it collectively. So basically, it was allowed for humankind to have a type of use right uh, over, this, uh, over the land, but that they did not own it. And Pufendorf, he reasoned, that this privilege uh, equaled what was known as a negative community. And a negative community is one where there either no person or neither a person or community would have property rights of the other. Now this is in opposition to the conception of the positive community whereby property is communally held by, uh, by the people or by the community. So what is interesting when we look at these particular theories is that while they were initially created to dispossess the indigenous people of their natural resources, uh, in later interpretations or articulations by uh, certain revolutionary European thinkers, uh, they use these theories to argue quite the opposite. It's namely that Pufendorf's uh, treaties uh, support the right of the European dispossessed or basically the peasantry or the proletariat uh, against the landowning or capital, uh, capitalist classes in Europe. So the argument was advanced that since the European proletariat or peasantry uh, actually created items with their labor, property belonged belong properly to those who mix their physical labor with this uh, production. So this by necessity would exclude the industrialists and aristocrats and so on who, according to this theory, would arguably be absentee landlords. Uh, James Mill, he also further advanced uh, this type of um, appropriation of, of uh, colonial assets, uh, particularly in his theory of British, or, or in his book, which, which was known as The History of British India. And he stated, in regard to India, that only one conclusion may be drawn uh, from, uh, and that the only conclusion that can be drawn is that the property of the soil reli uh, resided in the sovereign. And what he meant by the sovereign is more or less the tribal chieftain. And uh, how is this utilized in order to appropriate the assets? Is that he argued that the tribal chieftain owned the land in the subsurface minerals, uh, but that this was a bit of a ruse in the sense that many of these native peoples, they had no concept of absolute monarchy, and they had no concept of property, or the, their concept of property ownership was not the same as in Europe during that time period. So to consider that, uh, that there was even an aspect of property ownership and that this property was owned by the tribal chieftain, who really had no conception of this, and thereby you could make some type of contract or agreement with this tribal chieftain. Oftentimes it was for uh, mere trinkets, uh, as we saw the sale of Manhattan or, or so on, is that this allowed the subsequent alienation of the land uh, through various uh, contracts and agreements with this ostensible sovereign who was elevated to a position which there was really no concept uh, previously. So combined with this theory was also that of John Locke who argued that in the idyllic state of nature nobody has private dominion exclusive of the rest of mankind. And it was only through the labor of the person or the laborer's body and the work of his hands that something becomes property. So when you look at the combination of Mill's theories with that of Locke 
Uh, this was able to dispossess most of the indigenous people of their natural resources. So as I indicated earlier, the colonialists would buy the land from the tribal chieftains, and, uh, and then because they would work to bring the subsurface minerals to the surface of the land, uh, this would thereby defend their appropriation against all subsequent legitimacy challenges that were brought, uh, that were brought there for subsequently. So uh, in this vein, uh, European legal thought declared that mere habitation on the land does not equate to a legitimate claim of the land. And it's only through work and development of it, so basically putting it to profitable use, that enforced certain claims. And I think that this is very important to realize because this goes back to the basis of the claims of international oil companies, particularly during the 50s and 60s and 70s when they attempted to uh, protect their ownership right against increasing, ch increasing challenges uh, coming from the host states. So these theories, uh, when they were developed, uh, they led to the inescapable legal conclusion that because the European mother country had the technology, or mother countries, had the technology and expertise necessary to unearth and exploit these subsurface minerals, uh, these resources became more or less the public good of the West, or they became basically essential for economic growth and industrialization uh, for the developed world at that time. But afterwards, uh, there were certain theories that were developed to express uh, the notion that perhaps this is no longer viable and that there needs to be room to allow other countries to develop and so on. And one of the first thinkers that really <coughs> developed this, his name was Frederick List. And uh, Frederick List was a German economist uh, during the early 19th century, and he's known as the father of economic nationalism. Now, economic nationalism is more or less the umbrella theory for, uh, for resource nationalism. And uh, what he argued <coughs> And, and what he studied was uh, the issue of the late industrializers. So the late industrializers, uh, this is a concept of countries that attempted to develop and industrialize after Britain in the 19th century. And these, com these countries were uh, more or less, or, or what List argued was that these countries entered into global competition severely hampered and that they had uh, significant obstacles. And uh, basically his theory argued that uh, they lack technology. So because they lack the essential technology, this required them to defend their infant industries by other means, by legal and regulatory means. And the legal and regulatory means, according to List, by which they should be defended, would be strong protective tariffs and the imposition of a legal regulatory regime that would discourage foreign imports uh, from flooding the market. And uh, when we look at this um, notion of foreign imports that are flooding, that flood the market and destroy the the, the local industry, this can be seen with India, for instance. So uh, one should not talk about how India <coughs> is industrializing. Actually, one should speak about how India is actually re-industrializing because India had a type of industry several centuries ago, but because of the low-cost textile imports that took place uh, during the 18th, 19th century, uh, particularly from Britain and from Man Manchester, to be much more specific, uh, this basically decimated uh, the local industry, and India more or less became de-industrialized because of this. So most of the Western countries, if we look at it, uh, in terms of uh, the U.S., uh, Germany, France, Italy, uh, they all utilized listing methods in order to industrialize. They all did. Uh, they did not industrialize by a free market uh, free market uh, form or model. No, they all instituted very stiff protectionist measures to protect their uh, local industry, and by that they were able to uh, build up an infant industry which is strong enough to in enter competition, uh, global competition with, uh, with Britain. And once that occurred, then they start to argue much more for a lowering of tariffs and so on. But previously they did not. So it's even debatable whether a country can be industrialized without even instituting that. And we can see this even with the rise of the East Asian tigers, China, or so on. I really have no, um, I, I haven't seen a country industrialized without utilizing these means in terms of protecting the local industry. So List argued that the natural resources of a country should be directed towards fueling this economic growth allied with having some type of legal regulatory uh, protective uh, structure over, over this to, to shield it from competition. However, one of the main problems with List is that he did not consider uh, the obstacles that developing countries, uh, more or less uh, former colonial countries, faced uh, because the structures that inhibited them uh, was more or less uh, what is known as the dual economy. 
Now, this concept of the dual economy, which is what even most oil exporting countries uh, suffer from today, is that, uh, is that when a country was under colonial status, more or less a bifurcated economic system arose. So what did that mean? That meant basically that there was a stunted uh, domestic uh, handicraft type of economy, which was uh, constructed to meet uh, local needs. And then uh, the natural resource sector, uh, which was oil, gas, but could be anything, could be bauxite, tin, or, or what have you, uh, or rubber even. Uh, this sector had the technology and capital, but it was geared towards the international market. So this would be a type of enclave economic sector which would have very little backward and forward, forward linkages with the rest of the economy. So it was uh, quite uh, segmented. So the heritage of this dualistic economic structure was nothing less than a foreign economic enclave zone which juxtaposed a domestic economic sector and uh, there was basically little benefit for the rest of the economy. So even when these economic enclaves would spread to the rest of the economy, such as mining, plantation, uh, such as the mining plant, uh, plantation sector did, uh, the benefits still remain tied to the economic interests and demand cycles of the colonial countries rather than to the more robust domestic uh, economy. So these colonial structures uh, left uh, both these internal and external residuals uh, that uh, generally impeded national economic development and full state control over the natural resources. So List had a very important point, of course, is that a national economy needs to be formed in order to promote economic industrialization and so on. However, his approach did not deal with the colonial heritage, which uh, obstructs the economic development even today of many of the oil uh, exporting countries. So I went over uh, previously how there's uh, the heritage of Imperial Spain uh, in terms of the construction of resource nationalism and the idea that uh, the crown uh, owns uh, the underlying subsurface assets and so on and then this idea uh, transition to the idea of the nation owning the subsurface uh, minerals. But uh, not only was it Imperial Spain but also Latin America began the wave of uh, nationalization that swept, that later swept over the world. And this is due principally to two factors. One factor was the 1910 Mexican Revolution, and the result of the 1910 Mexican Revolution was the construction of uh, a new constitution in 1917. And uh, the constitution in 1917 was uh, very radical to the extent that it articulated this notion that uh, subsurface minerals, and oil in particular, were uh, let's say, under the mandate of the central authorities. And then also, Mexico contributed to this nationalization drive uh, by the nationalization in 1938 uh, of PEMEX, of the foreign uh, assets uh, within Mexico. So, in the 1917 Constitution, it had a very far-reaching article. And this article was Article 27. And this vested the nation with the inalienable right uh, to subsurface minerals. And basically what Article 27 did was it reaffirmed the principle of the ownership of subsurface minerals should be held exclusively by the Mexican state or by its nationals. And at that time these were relatively extreme notions of state sovereignty that was unknown to the developing world. I mean the only other example that came close was uh, the Bolshevik Revolution in 1918. And then in 1920 there was a wholesale um, uh, nationalization or expropriation of the oil asset, particularly in Azerbaijan, uh, Baku during that time. But uh, outside of the Soviet world, uh, this is basically unseen for a, a colonized or former uh, colonial country or a colonized country to be able to uh, develop this principle and exert this on the international stage. So although Article 27 did raise the prospect of authorizing the government uh, to own these subsurface minerals, but at that time it still didn't express the right that the government should be able to expropriate uh, the assets of foreign uh, companies that were active. This came much later. So when Mexico did expropriate uh, foreign assets in 1938, it did face stiff retribution uh, and, and a stiff reaction from international oil companies for this action. And principally the international oil companies, they were afraid that this would serve as a type of demonstration effect for other countries and that uh, they would follow this, other uh, oil uh, producing countries, and that it would spread like wildfire fire through the prairie. So they punished Mexico significantly for this action because they wanted to make certain that no other country would be able to do this uh, again. And they were correct, although uh, Mexico did suffer heavily for this, it did provide the impetus uh, for later countries to be able to question 
uh, the perceived omnipotence of the international oil companies. And then afterwards, of course, 1952, we had Mohammed Musaddiq uh, in Iran that attempted to nationalize, and of course, he faced stiff, uh, a very stiff reaction uh, from uh, international oil companies and, of course, from the West for his action. And uh, personally, he paid quite a price for that. Even though there was a death sentence handed down to him, uh, it was never carried out, but he ended up dying a broken man. And uh, this 1952, actually, when you go back to it, uh, this type of, um, uh, 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 the, the power that this had in the Iranian national consciousness uh, was extremely strong, and one could say that actually this played a role in uh, 1979 in terms of the Islamic Revolution. So it, it must be remembered that these actions do have a result. And, and I do recall uh, reading how Kermit Roosevelt, I believe that he was either, I believe either the grandson or the, the grand nephew of um, Theodore Roosevelt, but basically he bragged that he was able to pull off the, the coup d'etat in uh, Tehran uh, with a million dollars and in two weeks, and he was able to uh, pay off a group of people to protest and, and so on. So, I mean, there are ramifications. But if we look at the steady progression of, uh, of this idea, this notion of resource nationalism, then we can say that really it became entrenched with the foundation, or with the establishment of OPEC in 1960s. And this was really when the, these ideas of resource nationalism spread from Latin America to the Middle East. And uh, the first salvo started uh, when two men came together. Uh, one man, his name was Juan uh, Perez Alfonso, and he was uh, from Venezuela. And the other was Abdullah Tariqi. And Abdullah Tariqi, he was known as the Red Sheikh, uh, basically because of his perceived socialist uh, leanings, uh, because he was more or less a, a Nasserite. Uh, during that time, but they had some essential differences about how to go about uh, increasing control for uh, for oil producing countries over their natural resources. Alfonso uh, was an, an adherent to the ideas of uh, Previch, Raul Previch, who was an uh, Argentinian uh, economist, and basically uh, what Previch developed was this theory that there was a long-term price degradation, uh, degradation of uh, primary products, and that the only way that countries would be able to control this is that if they were to form cartels, uh, natural resource cartels, and uh, basically institute production restrictions so that they would not suffer from the increasing uh, devaluation of their natural resources. So Alfonso was a, a very significant promoter of, of this idea. And he thought that this would allow the oil producing countries to be able to uh, preserve higher prices. Now as a Nasserite, uh, El Tariqi, uh, he was much more radical, actually. Uh, his policy was for total contractual reformation. So basically, if you want to put it in a nutshell, it was full nationalization. And uh, the argument of Tariqi was that the relations between the international oil companies and the developing uh, oil producing countries were so asymmetrical that the only appropriate remedy uh, was through total nationalization of oil production. Yes, please. Just a quick question. What was his nationality? He was Saudi. Saudi. He was Saudi, and he held the portfolio of oil minister from 1960 to 1962. Uh, but he was later pushed out when there was uh, infighting between uh, uh, King Saud and, uh, and then Crown Prince Faisal. Uh, Faisal. So uh, King Saud was known as being much more, some would say, under the thumb of uh, Jamal Abdel Nasser, and he had uh, put uh, El Tariqi into uh, this particular position. And then when El Saud was pushed out, then also El Tariqi was pushed out as well. And uh, many of the ruling family did not like the ideas of uh, El Tariqi uh, simply because he said that uh, Saudi Arabia and the rest of the Gulf countries held the oil in trust for all Arabs. So his rallying cry was Arab oil for Arabs, not necessarily Saudi oil for Saudis. So that was one of the reasons that uh, he was pushed out along with uh, King Saud uh, during that time during the palace uh, infighting. Another question. When, was the Shah, when did the Shah come into power? Uh, the Shah? 53. Well, well, actually, Riza Shah, and, and actually I would uh, ask him, but I was thinking it was 1925 when Riza Shah first came into power, right? Riza Shah in 1925? Yeah, yeah. Riza Shah, yeah. 20 years. He was on power and Muhammad Riza Shah. Right, exactly. So Mohammad Reza Shah came during the 1920s and came to power. And then uh, the Prime Minister, Mohammad Mossadegh, he was elected, I believe, in 1950 or so. And then after he was pushed out, then, uh, the, then the Shah that we all know of, he came to power after him. And then it was more or less a, monarchical, a monarchical system. So in 1952, would that be correct? Yes. Same here. 
Now, he came to power in 1945, but he became an authoritarian dictator after Mossadegh in 1952. Right, 1952, thank you very much. Right. So 1952, uh, Prime Minister Mossadegh was, was pushed out, uh, he was deposed, and then, uh, and then the Shah came to power and he became a monarchical system. So the peacock throne or so on had supreme power. Uh, so to, to talk about the current context of uh, resource nationalism, uh, there's quite an ideological component uh, that I'd like to go over. Uh, and, and it's a bit different from uh, what occurred earlier on if we talk about the Spanish colonial view. And the ideological component is strongly linked to the notion of uh, what should be the proper role of the state in the operation of the national economy. So in a quarter century after World War II, there was an extremely large uh, state involvement in the economic systems. Uh, of much of the world, uh, the West and even in the developing countries. And most countries uh, held the view that, uh, and also the populations, that the proper role of the government should be to intervene directly into the economy to address uh, very pertinent uh, social and economic uh, problems. Now this was also a lie to the view that in the developing world that a strong push was uh, necessary in order to promote uh, development and investment. Uh, but when we look at the high point of resource nationalism from the 1970s, uh, when most countries were exerting uh, control of their oil sector. The 1980s and 90s were a low point of resource nationalism, and there were several reasons for that. Uh, with the election of uh, President Reagan and Prime Minister Thatcher in the 1980s, uh, most, if not all, status notions were under philosophical attack during that time. So this is where we see uh, the, what is known as the neoliberal theory or whatnot start to gain traction. Uh, the IMF, the World Bank, and WTO, they all promoted significantly the idea that there should be less, not more, state involvement uh, in the economic uh, sectors. And then there was also uh, the sustained drop in the international price of oil. And uh, two shocks occurred. One was in 1986, and the other occurred in the Asian financial uh, cra uh, crisis of 1997. And this caused many oil producing countries to have extremely dire financial uh, difficulties. And uh, they experienced decreasing investment in their oil fields, and they reached out to many of the IOCs for investment. And in the process, they offered very attractive uh, fiscal, uh, fiscal terms and investment packages. But in the 2000s, the early 2000s, resource nationalism came to the fore, forefront again. And uh, as I indicated earlier, this was much different from uh, the variety in the 1960s. And uh, to a certain extent, uh, some aspects of, these of this new resource nationalism was uh, tied in with a bit of, um, uh, you could say, anti-Western, uh, Westernism or anti-Americanism or even anti-British uh, British, uh, philosophy, uh, simply because uh, the Iraq war had caused uh, certain tensions over the world. So particularly when we look at uh, Chavez in Venezuela or if we look at uh, Morales in Bolivia or so on, uh, some, many of their actions were actually linked to their quote unquote uh, challenge uh, of uh, this, um, this uh, system which is dominated uh, by the West. And uh, this was a very polarized atmosphere. And um, considering that many perceived, although it may not uh, be accurate, but it was perceived at that time in many quarters that the Iraq invasion was over oil uh, assets. Although I don't tend to believe that simply because uh, I, I don't believe that you could get all of these uh, generals on board uh, to uh, invade a country simply to control its oil. So, I mean, that does not make sense to me. But this was the perception, obviously, in many uh, quarters. And also there was a disillusionment with globalization. And uh, this ideology was a bit connected with what is known as the Beijing uh, consensus. And uh, basically, it was that when there were anti-globalization riots in the 1990s, early 2000s, uh, there was a questioning of the basic foundation of um, of neoliberalism. And uh, just to, I'm going to end up uh, short, I'm going to end fairly shortly, but I would just like to, to show the difference between the 1970s and let's say 2009 or even what is the current uh, atmosphere or environment for international oil companies. 1970, uh, there were, uh, IOCs had nearly full access to oil reserves, 85%. If you look at uh, 2009, NOCs, national oil companies, what about 65%, and the, only the areas with full uh, international oil company access is about 8% or so. So you can see that this is an entirely different environment than it was uh, even several decades ago. So just very quickly, the Arab Spring. How is this going to impact uh, resource nationalism? What do they want? 
again, this is a central question. Now, of course, the situation is quite dynamic, quite fluid, but I think that we can just look at uh, several things and perhaps we can posit some scenarios. Uh, on one hand, uh, when you increase the participation of large segments of the population that have not had a voice, you could have the rise of populist politics, and you could even have more resource nationalism. Because one of the things that a more or less uh, authoritarian government is able to do, it's able to um, push through certain unpopular measures that perhaps the people do not agree with. And this can be seen in Egypt, for instance, with the uh, sale of liquefied natural gas to Israel. Now, uh, many people in Egypt perceive that this natu liquefied natural gas was uh, sold to Israel at below market pricing, and there's a lot of anger uh, over this. So, uh, just uh, several weeks ago, uh, with the new transitional government, uh, the new transitional government has indicated that it's going to review this contract with Israel uh, simply to, uh, to meet uh, the popular anger at this. We can also look at Iraq as well. Uh, in Iraq, uh, after the elections and so on, uh, initially after the uh, invasion of Iraq, uh, certain ideas were put forward that there would be, uh, that the oil resources would be fully privatized. Uh, but that quickly fell uh, to the wayside as large segments of the Iraqi population became mobilized and they demanded uh, that the state exercise a significant control. I mean, so if we look at these uh, as, if we look at these examples as reference, then perhaps we can see that the increasing proportion of the population that's going to have a voice, perhaps this would push for or argue for more resource nationalism. Now, there is a contrasting view, and I don't think this is as likely, but of course, with democratization and so on, perhaps you could have uh, increasing market liberalization. So, some of these countries, in particular, if we look at Egypt, may be in need of. Uh, of, of funds uh, because of the chaos and turmoil associated with the recent revolution. So they might have to reach out to the World Bank or IMF or so on, which would thereby um, encourage the countries to implement uh, a structural adjustment uh, packages or what have you. So basically liberal, liberalize large segments of their economy. So it can go either way, but I think that it would be much more that the people have the voice, they would demand that their governments listen to them and that they would produce their oil and that they would develop certain policies which would express their wants and desires. So thank you very much uh, for uh, attending and if you have any questions I'd be quite pleased to answer them. Thank you. Thank you. So we have, uh, we have about 35 minutes for questions uh, and uh, I'd like to invite you to ask questions. Yes, Justin. I agree with everything you say. What I want to ask about is this inherent tension where on the one hand we have rising global commodity prices over the long run, especially in food. Robert Zolnick just issued a second warning that we're only one crisis away from a major humanitarian situation due to rising global food prices. And then on the other hand, like in Africa, for example, you have increasing tendencies towards democratic or populist policy. It seems there's a contradiction or tension between those two. So I think that makes the first scenario you suggested more likely. Yeah, well, that, that's a very good question. And I do appreciate your comment that you agree with everything that I said. Uh, that, that's well, I appreciate it. <laughs> my question was also, if you agree with what I just said, that yes. tension, does that increase the likelihood of these individual states withdrawing from international treaties, such as trade treaties? Well, well, that's a very good question. Actually, one thing that I can um, actually state, which I hadn't brought up, is that, uh, and actually I haven't seen the study of this, but I'm certain that there are studies, is that it, I would like to see uh, a graph showing price rises of basic commodities and, and social, social political instability. So if we look at the French Revolution, of course the French Revolution was precipitated in a large degree by the rise of uh, bread, bread prices. Okay? And Marie Antoinette with her famous saying, let them, eat let them eat cake. Of course, cake at that time did not mean chocolate cake, it was actually a type of um, it was a substantive, uh, substantial food stuff, actually. Uh, but uh, definitely, this precipitated many of the tensions within France. And even if we look at Egypt in 1977, uh, with uh, Anwar Sadat, uh, there was a, a significant riot uh, within Cairo. Uh, over, I think it was about 200 people died. Anti-government slogans were chanted. The military had to be sent in. Uh, this occurred during the process of Infidah, which is the opening or liberalization. So the basic commodities, namely bread or Aish, as, as is known as, uh, in Egypt, and actually 
uh, in Egyptian Arabic, bread is aish, which actually means life in Arabic as well. So that's how central bread is. So when the price increased uh, precipitously, this uh, caused people to get out into to the streets and mobilize and so on. Now, why is this important? Okay, I'd like us to look at the rise of the um, basic commodities in light of the energy independ independence policies of many of the Western countries, as well as the rising demand in the BRIC countries, rising demand for uh, biofuel production, as well as for uh, basic foodstuffs. Uh, in 2000, only about 1% of the global uh, of grain and so on was utilized for uh, production of uh, biofuels. Okay, so basically as inputs into the production of biofuels, uh, uh, it was only about 1%. And then 2010, it was about 6% about 6%, so there's been a precipitous increase uh, in the sense of food being used as inputs into biofuel production. And this has put pressure, upward pressure, on the rise of basic commodities uh, during that time, time period. So 2007, 2008, these, this was a period of, of, uh, of extreme price rises for uh, basic uh, food commodities. Now, if we look at the period from this past January into February, uh, or actually March, so from January to March, um, the period of extreme agitation within the Arab world, basic food, the, the price of basic food commodities increased by 25% in this time period. So I'm not saying there's necessarily a causation, but definitely there is some type of correlation between the inability of people to meet their basic needs and social instability. Now, uh, so I, I would agree with you. I think that, yes, I, I think that as long as the authoritarian governments are meeting their basic commitments, if we talk about the, the social contract or the Arab social contract, okay, they mean their basic commitments. So they're saying that we're going to give you jobs, we're going to give you economic growth, we're going to give you food or what have you, but you must remain silent. You must not say anything. And I think more or less the people will, or at least for a long period of time, they accepted this. But when we start to see this system break down, then you start to see people question the basic tenets. They're saying that you cannot even provide this for us. So why should we even uh, listen to you? Why should we take uh, your abuse and so on? Because we're not even getting enough food. So I think we start to see a questioning of the basic tenets of, of the social contract that many of these authoritarian states had constructed. So I think, yes, there is some type of correlation between rising political instability and democratization in much of the developing world and the inability of these states to increasingly meet uh, the food needs of their populace. So there is some type of connection between these two. As to whether they would withdraw from international treaties, um, that's up in the air. It depends. It depends how these movements are going to unfold. Um, these movements are different from the popular mobilization in the 1950s and 60s, which were quite, quite anti-imperialist in their scope, so in particular after the Suez Canal crisis. So during that time, these countries were against Britain, France, the U.S., Israel, and so on, and, it, and they were rejectionist uh, movements. Uh, they did not want to be incorporated into the global status quo. These movements now are quite different. They're talking about individual rights. They're talking about democracy. They're talking about these things. They're not talking about cultural defense, which is before they were saying that uh, there should not necessarily that that. We don't necessarily want individual rights, but we want our culture to be protected. So as a result, our individual rights can be suppressed as long as our cultural rights are expressed on an international stage. And this would, of course, uh, be much more connected to removing these countries from international agreements which they perceive to be um, uh, not uh, justifiable for and not supportive of their um, independence and sovereignty. But now I, I think that it may not be as likely that these countries would um, remove themselves from the WTO and, and so on and so forth. I, I think that these countries, to a certain degree, they could be uh, much more, um, their role might be much more enhanced in the global economic and global political infrastructure, simply because now they'd be democratic, uh, democratic countries, more or less, and, and so on. So I don't perceive that as necessarily happening or will happen, but I think that there is a potential for that. Yes, please. Um, you mentioned that, uh, in your view, also creation of OPEC was an important uh, stage in uh, economic nationalism. But um, I, I think OPEC came about after uh, some of these countries had already nationalized it. And it really didn't uh, campaign to go forward with further nationalism. It was simply a cartel among those countries that had nationalized their oil to control the prices. Um, 
Don't you agree with this? Uh, well, it, it's a good point, but um, in many of the countries there had not been full-scale nationalization in many of the countries. So I, if you look at the Gulf countries, for instance, uh, they still did not, they still had not at that time nationalized their, their oil sectors. But, but OPEC didn't contribute to that. Uh, initially, OPEC did not, but OPEC was, uh, it had an ideological contribution, namely that they said that well, there's going to be a form of oil producing countries and that we're going to work collectively. Okay, and this was related to the ideas of Raoul Prevage that said that countries need to uh, create re uh, uh, basic commodity cartels. Uh, so uh, during that time, there's also, OPEC is not the only natural resource cartel, there's also bauxite cartels, much short-lived though, tin cartels and, and so on, all in order to, and cocoa cartels as well, all in order to promote collaboration between these countries. Now, uh, you're, you're absolutely correct, at least initially, OPEC did not do anything substantively in order to counteract, uh, let's say, foreign control over uh, natural resources. But at the same time, OPEC serve as notice to many of the international oil companies. And many of the countries use OPEC as a form, as a collaborative measure to, to increase their fiscal take. So initially, if we look at Libya, for instance, or if we look at Venezuela, we even look at Iran or some of the other countries, what they did was they started to increase their fiscal take. So they wanted to increase their uh, taxation or royalty uh, regime or so on that was levied on international oil companies. Then later on, this transition towards uh, full-scale nationalization within many of the uh, oil-producing countries. And in particular, this happened with the Dahran Agreement. Uh, and the Dahran Agreement was actually in, this was in 1972, 71, 72. And this was actually when OPEC became a viable organization. And then we started to see OPEC have a presence. But the basic ideological stance of OPEC, we must remember, is that oil-producing countries have the right to control what their commodity is being sold for in the international market. And I think that this is part and parcel of resource nationalism. Um, thank you very much for your presentation. Thank you. And then your last graph that you had was yeah. the most fascinating to me. Um, and I was actually... This actually, one? No, this one. Yes, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I was But I'm really wondering what your belief is for companies or for countries that are oil importers, basically. Yes what this change in landscape means for countries like the United States that are importing a lot of oil, especially with relates to security concerns yes. that they have, as it is the control significantly less uh, over the natural resources for these importing states now that we've moved to uh, the NFCs having the majority of the them. Yes, I mean, I think that was definitely a fear uh, during the first uh, large-scale nationalizations that occurred. But uh, very quickly, uh, the West learned to live with OPEC. And uh, there were certain benefits, actually, of having OPEC around um, uh, and having an organization controlling or attempting to influence the price of oil. One of the reasons is that the U.S. is a significant oil-producing country. Okay, and, uh, but still, the, basically, the cost of production in the U.S. is more or less about 12 to $14 per barrel of oil. And uh, the fields tend to be much more mature. That means that the reservoir pressure uh, is, is uh, lowers is much lower, and uh, so natural gas within these reservoirs is, is quite low, and so these tend to be marginal fields. And uh, the cost of production within the Gulf, uh, let's say if we look at Saudi Arabia for example, is, is perhaps only a dollar, so it's not even that much. So to have these countries voluntarily restrict their oil output is actually quite uh, beneficial for domestic oil production within the United States. So many domestic oil producers in the United States actually uh, support OPEC's fundamental aims. Uh, they would hate to see Saudi Arabia flood the market in oil and then they would basically be pushed out of business. And this was one of the fears in 1986 uh, when uh, Saudi Arabia basically uh, unleashed uh, the hounds of, uh, of war, I guess you can say, they basically flooded the market. Uh, there was a fear in many quarters that U.S. domestic oil production would collapse because the price was much too low. So I think that we need to keep this in focus. But um, in 1982, uh, you had the creation, or basically OPEC stopped posting a price for oil, and basically they attempted to influence the price by production quotas. Okay, but yet there still is an international market mechanism that's operating. Uh, so oil is bought and sold not primarily through bilateral contracts or through certain national aims. It's bought and sold through the national mar or through the international market. So uh, these days, I don't think that there's necessarily a fear that uh, OPEC would necessarily or that um, 
that, uh, that the Gulf countries would necessarily attempt to uh, become nationalistic all of a sudden and not sell to the United States so that there might be a new type of oil embargo. I, I don't think that's a fear. But I think more of the fear is that countries like China, for instance, are going to increasingly reach out to oil producing countries and form bilateral contracts and uh, give these countries low-cost uh, infrastructure loans or, or, or what have you, and basically attempt to uh, to 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 uh, control or basically to to have a direct uh, connection with these oil-producing countries, so that they would ship the oil to China, and China would give them access to uh, low-cost loans and so on. And so I think that is more the fear today that there's going to be increasing competition between oil-importing countries for what some people perceive is a decreasing amount of oil which would be available on the international market. And that is how we s I, I think that U.S. policymakers are attempting to deal with this now. It's not so much that it's going to come from oil producing countries, but that increasing competition. And Michael Clare, for instance, he has, um, most of his books deal with this topic of increasing competition, resource competition between uh, oil importing countries and so on. So the NOCs, uh, let's say of China or of, um, of uh, Malaysia or so on, India, uh, these are becoming much more significant actors on the international stage. So s there have been some calls that perhaps the U.S. should form its own national oil company and attempt to um, compete with these other international uh, with these other national oil companies for access to what are perceived to be decreasing amounts of oil available. Thank you. Sure. I have a question on what you think of the drivers of the most recent type of resource nationalism might be. One, one could argue that it's mostly political ideological, anti-Western sentiment that you suggest in a couple of cases, or is it more pragmatic economical, uh, economic drivers? Uh, some argue um, that the prevalence of resource nationalist policy is closely correlated with high oil prices. Do you see um, one of those factors playing a stronger role or in different regions? Uh, definitely, I would say in different reasons, in different regions, there would be different, um, different motivations, I would say. Uh, but overall, they're connected. Uh, because when you have increasing oil prices, then on one hand, you have the sentiment of the populace, which says that we should capture this differential, this profit. So this, is, this sentiment is more or less behind the, call, behind the cause of uh, windfall. Uh, taxation uh, programs and, and so on. And then on the other hand, there's the pragmatic reason that the government, that most governments seek to increase their fiscal take and they seek to increase their uh, their revenue. So I mean, even the U.S. Uh, under President Obama has increased the reach of the IRS to seek out these tax havens and so on and so forth because it wants to increase its revenue. I mean, so that's purely pragmatic. Any government uh, in the world wants to increase its revenue without necessarily being nationalistic. Uh, but uh, at the same time, within many of these countries that were foreign colonies or that have had uh, fairly recent experiences with, them, with uh, let's say, um, imperialism or, or what have you, British imperialism or French imperialism or, or so on, uh, this is definitely a, a motivating factor, this, this notion of being sovereign, okay, this notion that we control our natural resources and that we should be able to dictate what price we get for this. Okay, so some of these countries are under pressure from their uh, domestic constituents. And uh, we must not forget, even in, in, in authoritarian states, there is domestic pressure. Definitely there is. And, 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 and the way that many of these countries attempt to deal with this is through different methods, okay? And one of the ways is by showing themselves as confronting these international oil companies, which are quote unquote appendages of, uh, of the West or of colonialism or so on. So this always plays well for the, the public or, or the Arab streets or the Latin street or, or so on. And, and so on. So I think that there, this, this is connected. But it is cyclical to a certain extent, whereby with the rise, the more recent resource nationalism that we've seen from 2000 onward is connected with capturing uh, the rent, increasing the fiscal take, but then also there were certain geopolitical concerns which were allied with this. But I think that um, resource nationalism may be a dying philosophy. Uh, I think that if we look at 20, 30 years, let's look at this graph. Uh, most of the oil is being controlled now by national oil companies. So in 20 years, is really going to be a need to express um, resource nationalism when it's controlled by your own national oil company? I mean, I mean, so resource nationalism was at its peak in the 1960s and 1970s. That was at its peak when the international oil companies controlled most of the oil reserves. But I think that uh, we're going to increasingly see that once they have everything under control, that it would cease to be this type of revolutionary philosophy because more or less they control the facts on the ground. I, I, uh, um, to 
follow up a little bit on that. Um, what about the role of oil as a, as a tool of foreign policy um, and the extent to which that we might even be seeing that in the uh, reactions of the West to, um, to some of the Arab Spring, uh, Arab Spring movements within different countries, for example, Bahrain, you know, we may be, uh, we may be seeing a, a reluctance of a strong public reaction uh, to Saudi Arabia's and, and the GCC's support of, of uh, um, government action there, as opposed to in um, countries where the GCC, which is a major um, producer of oil, is less involved. And, and if so, if that is a significant tool of foreign policy, do you see that changing with the rise of international oil companies, or will the governments continue to try and, and uh, have enough of a say in how Western governments, no, uh, the local governments, yes. uh, will continue to try and have a say in uh, in production and price setting in order to have that uh, tool in their uh, foreign policy? Toolbox. Uh, absolutely, absolutely. I mean, I, I, oil is definitely, oil is definitely a foreign policy concern, definitely a foreign, foreign policy tool. Um, I, I can preface this with uh, something very interesting. I saw actually during the movie Blood Diamonds, uh, there was a scene where uh, there was an old man who was the only survivor left in one of the villages that had just been decimated by the RUF, the Revolutionary United Front. And uh, of course, much of this war was being fueled by access to diamonds. And then uh, this old man said to the character played by Leonardo DiCaprio that, you know, thank God we don't have oil. You know, then we'd really have a problem. So, uh, oil definitely, when you have a lot of oil, you do have power, but then you also open yourself up to geopolitical maneuvering as well, so the great game and so on. So, uh, it's really difficult to, let's say, form a fully independent policy, I would say, with oil, but at the same time you have a lot of power. So Saudi Arabia, in particular in the role of uh, this, uh, these disturbances and so on, uh, simply because it produces so much oil, uh, I would say that the U.S. is loath to try to pressure it too much. And now the relations between Saudi Arabia and the U.S. are actually at its lowest point, I would say, since 2003, simply because uh, the Saudi leadership uh, viewed uh, the United States as, you know, to use this colloquial expression, throwing Mubarak underneath the bus, and that they were not happy with this. And so when Saudi Arabia uh, activated the, uh, the Peninsula Shield, uh, which is the GCC military agreement, sent troops into Bahrain, uh, it did this basically without U.S. consultation. Uh, it thought that it had the right to do this. Um, so oil in foreign policy is going to be, I think, going forward, it moves the U.S. to perhaps not criticize uh, certain actions that are, are taking place right now, for instance, in Bahrain. Uh, some of the stories coming out of Bahrain are quite uh, harrowing, uh, for instance, that it rivals uh, some things that you've heard from Libya or, or, or Syria, but uh, at the same time, there's very little condemnation of, uh, of Bahrain. So the U.S. Is, is, is quite loath to see its traditional relationship become, up, or, or become upset or upended with uh, many of the Gulf countries. And uh, it's not going to criticize these countries as of yet until the social forces become too much to handle. And oil does play a role behind this. And also the fifth fleet and security needs and so on. Because one of the main things that we need to remember is that the US does not import the majority of its oil from the Gulf or from the Middle East. Um, but the Middle East was always strategic simply because um, during the Cold War and so on, US allies uh, Europe, Western Europe, and Japan had imported the majority of their oil from this region. So the U.S. acted as a type of policeman, or as a guarantor of uh, security and so on, to be able to allow its allies access to uh, low-cost oil, relatively low-cost or, or oil free from interruption. So this is going forward, uh, I think to answer the second part of your question, uh, I think that uh, local governments, if they open themselves up more to popular participation, we might start to see a bit more of these populist politics um, uh, take part uh, in the national discourse on, on whether they should continue to be uh, allied with the Western powers or with the United States, or whether they should just look for their um, independent security needs and perhaps reach out to China much more. And we've seen a little shift in Saudi Arabian policy, which is reaching out more to China for instance, but if we have much more of the youth have a voice and so on, 
uh, there tends to be a fair degree of anti-Western sentiment, uh, even though it's not expressed during the current um, uh, uh, instability. But still, I think that they would question their country's cozy relationship with the West. So you could see more oil being diverted to the Pacific, the Asian Pacific region, rather than to the West. Uh, so I, I think that this would perhaps just expedite what has been ongoing a uh, trend for uh, the past several years. So I think that this is more or less what would happen from uh, let's say U.S. involvement in the region and the populace's um, uh, uh, movement towards uh, giving themselves a greater voice in, in national politics and so on. I think oh, I think in that case you're you're <coughs> referring to layers of uh, international uh, intervention which can occur from a populist standpoint, yeah. so that the democratic movements could have been instigated by Western infiltration just to create regime change in deference to future control. Once the regime erodes sufficiently, it becomes useful to have control of the transitional government through some format. So if you use a democratic movement under the guise of being a, <clears throat> sort of an American ethic. You improve the view of America in the Arab street without getting the U.S. involved militarily, technically. So when Obama pulled out fast and shifted it over to NATO, it basically meant that he would alienate the Arab street. And at the same time, according to some stuff that I'm reading now, that there was uh, funding of Barada, which is a TV network in Syria, which was uh, fomenting, you know, basically <coughs> Assad's uh, association with Iran, so that then any sort of like penetration, like the Iranian warships into a Syrian port, which occurred approximately, they got, went through the Suez approximately the same time all of this started. That then, well, but of course then that fouls up the South Europeans' control over the, the, the grade of oil that, the, that Libya produces for them. So it, you can't go too far before you start really creating a big mess. Yes, I mean, I mean, well, you, you make a, I, there's a, there's an article in the New York Times, I think you might be referring to it about two, two days ago or three days ago about, uh, about the, the funding of certain democratic movements uh, in the Middle East by the U.S., uh, maybe even by the National Endowment of uh, Democracy. Yeah, Mark and so on. Right, right. So, I mean, I mean, I don't know. That um, it remains to be seen. I mean, definitely there were uh, basic grievances in many of these countries, and you cannot deny that. So, I mean, uh, you could stimulate these basic grievances, but many of the, the populists, I mean, they had basic issues, basic concerns, and they were fed up. So, uh, you know, this is something I think that we need to consider. But uh, at the same time, uh, I, I wouldn't want to overplay the role or overestimate the role that uh, perhaps the U.S. or the West has had in uh, fomenting certain change. And then we also have to ask this question. Why would the U.S. Now, it makes a certain amount of sense why the U.S. might seek to destabilize Syria or Libya. But why would it seek to stabilize, uh, destabilize its own allies, such as uh, Mubarak or or the Khalifa family, for instance, in Bahrain, or the Saud family. Uh, that, that's a basic question. Why would it seek to do that? Uh, because uh, these countries, they understand what's going on in the territory. Uh, the Mubarak's understood exactly uh, what groups are being promoted and were being, uh, which are being um, assisted and so on. Uh, so why would you want to destroy your relationship with these countries and then perhaps even allow a gap for uh, certain populist uh, movements to arise, which are thereby challenge uh, U.S. Uh, hegemony region. So, so that, that's actually a question I, I would like to ask you. Well, that's, that's, that's a risk. And there is a reference that I came across that there was a, a similar major uh, macroeconomic shift that occurred uh, uh, towards the beginning of the 19th century, uh, where there, there were rebellions that were occurring uh, because of possibly because of food, possibly because of some sort of economic uh, shift. So there may be something uh, larger than we're actually thinking about here. And that consequently, even minor perturbations 
uh, could be part of, of, a, of a macro event. So that these are just symptoms of, of, of a macro event. <clears throat> yes, I, I understand. I mean, some people argue, uh, although I don't necessarily adhere to it, that uh, these democratization movements are actually part of a war against the status, uh, the status ideology or against the uh, uh, status uh, philosophy of the, the paternal state. So that uh, there are several movements. One is that there's a macro movement which is against the, the state as a concept, as a viable concept in the paternal state or the strong man. And then uh, you have certain minor movements, which more or less be uh, support of, uh, or contingent support of these uh, strong men. So I mean, I have heard that. Um, I frankly, I, that's something that I can't necessarily speak upon as to whether that has happened or not, because I'm not privy to uh, these uh, discussions. Of uh, I guess if people are plotting to change the world, uh, they haven't invited me yet. So, so I, can't, I, I can't say whether it's accurate or not. But definitely, that is the view in certain quarters, and uh, and so on. So. That, that is the view, so, yes. I want to uh, be patient and wanted to make two very quick comments and ask you two quick questions. Sure. Um, just going back to this question of what is the strategic significance of the ship to the NOCs, and to add to what Justin said, there's also just the question of how well these NOCs are going to develop the resources in their home countries. And I think that's one of the biggest concerns, is that they're not actually developing them along commercial terms. Um, there have other reasons and means of investments and not as good technology. So it may be that while the world has the oil it needs, it won't actually develop those resources and bring it to market. Um, just, a, just a quick issue on the Iraq question. You and I can talk about this offline sure. longer. The, <coughs> actually, you had Saddam introduce the idea of production sharing agreements, so yes. the opposite of resource nationalism. Yes. And then after 2003, the Iraqi government under occupation um, put forward foreign investment laws, but they exempted, that were very liberal in terms of FDI, but they exempted the oil, because yeah. they said, we don't want to touch this until a democratic way like yes. government came in. Yes. And now what you have is foreign companies coming in, but under technical service agreements, yes. which are a little bit more. So there has been a lot of resource nationalism associated yes. with the shift, but maybe not as much as one might expect. A big, long, and interesting debate in Iraq. But my two quick questions, one is historical. Um, when you trace the development of this, the ideas behind resource nationalism, did you do this in conjunction with the development of the ideas around private property? Like, did you see any correlation between how the notion of private property became commonplace and did that have any connection with resource nationalism? I mean, if you didn't look at that, that's fine. And then just to, uh, my second question has to do with um, this whole question of are we going to see more resource nationalism on account of the Arab Spring. And I agree with you. I'm, I'm inclined to think it could go both ways, more likely to go in the direction of more resource nationalism, in part because you have new institutions and new parliaments, people newly elected that want to be involved in the politics of resource uh, development. But one issue which I wonder if you've looked at that might be interesting to look at is what is the relationship between economic crises and resource nationalism, because I think we're going to see quite soon a lot of these countries are going to have severe economic crises. And is there a relationship there? Will those crises actually lead them to welcome more foreign investment as the quickest way of getting revenues to address the economic crises that they're likely to face? Okay, well, all very good points. Um, your points uh, well taken what I read, because uh, definitely uh, the Bremer uh, administration did not want to touch uh, oil. Although that was put on the table, I think, prior to at least discussions as to whether it could be done. But uh, considering the sensibilities of the Iraqi people, that yeah, the oil cannot, yeah, that. oil cannot be touched. Uh, definitely. Um, in terms of the, the technical uh, agreements, uh, technical production agreements within Iraq, uh, basically what they do is they just hire, as you well know, and just for the rest of the audience, I mean, they hire international oil companies more or less as operators. Uh, so we start to see this role of international oil companies. Uh, they have been shut out, more or less, in terms of equity stakes within most oil producing countries. But now these oil producing countries have them on board just to produce the oil because they have access to better technology and so on. So as you correctly indicated, Megan, is that one of the fears of uh, having national oil companies is that if you look at, a, uh, let's say, two national oil companies, uh, Petavesa and Pemex, Petavesa in Venezuela, Pemex uh, in uh, Mexico, uh, 
we see that uh, the Cantoral field in Mexico, which is the largest field, is actually declining. And Mexico may be an oil importing country within the next uh, decade or even before that. And one of the reasons why is because the investment emanating from Pemex is uh, extremely minimal because it also has a social function as well. So, I mean, it, it seeks to hire, it, it, it seeks as, um, as an institution to hire people, to lower discontent, uh, to provide employment, and also much of its funds go to uh, different social programs. Same with PETAVESA, it's a very politicized organization. So we see that Venezuelan Mexican production has all decreased, and you can almost tie this in with increasing uh, politicization of these institutions. So I, I, that's a very good point you made. Um, in terms of property, yes, I did look at the notion of private property, and I think resource nationalism is intimately connected with the notion of private property. So within the Anglo-Saxon system, this goes back to Roman law, and it's more or less a law of capture. Uh, so that uh, the landowner, and this goes back to the British um, notion that um, that the that the home is a person's castle. Okay, is that uh, if you own the surface rights to the land, then you own the subsurface minerals as well. So this is a typical Anglo conception. Goes back to Roman law. Uh, but then the view, and this is what I want to kind of trace out: the view of the Spanish colonial authorities was that most of the land belonged to the crown. The Crown could give franchises, and the Crown could also give specific franchises for the subsurface minerals, but inherently these were owned by the Crown. And then there is a transition to this idea, particularly within Latin America, that you can really replace the Crown now with the nation, with the people, so thereby the nation. Yeah, the reason I raised it, I just thought it was an interesting contrast that actually with the Bolshevik Revolution yes. and communism, this whole idea of communal rights, yes, you yes. were getting the opposite on um, resource nationalism, if I understood you correctly, that actually we were getting notions of resource nationalism where pe where the subsurface rights were connected with the surface ownership of the land, or did I misunderstand? It just seemed like an interesting contrast oh, between oh. how notions of private property, right, home, right. You know, well, yeah. Well, actually, actually, what I meant within the Anglo view is that. Uh, the owner of the yeah. surface would own the subsurface right. minerals, except if it's on federal land or, or what have you. But within Latin America, no, it was it was different. Is that the, the traditional Spanish colonial view that the subsurface minerals were owned by the king? Then, with the nineteen with the 1917 Mexican Constitution, right. basically what it establishes that subsurface minerals, going back to Spanish colonial law, uh, was part and parcel of the nation. Uh, of the nation, so it's owned in common. So it's almost connected with the public good. So they considered uh, oil and the subsurface minerals to be a public good. Now the Bolsheviks, um, it's a bit connected with uh, socialism. It, it is because the 1910 revolution in Mexico, you had a lot of ver uh, various uh, political ideologies that were percolating. Uh, but uh, the Bolsheviks are much more radical because they believe that the government should control the means of production, uh, which is uh, communism in its essence. And of course, one of the central means of production was oil production. So that was the communist view. Uh, but when we look at uh, Latin America, yes, it was influenced this to a certain extent, but it was much more the view that it's a public good and that uh, the nation or that the government is holding this in trust for the people. So this is the basic articulation. And uh, when, we, when we look at uh, the resource nationalism in terms of the Arab Spring, uh, yeah, I think that uh, we could have some type of uh, interest politics or that are arising or, or ward politics. When I say ward politics like the type of politics you have in Chicago or, or Louisiana. I mean, in a sense you have politicking and you have certain interests and so on. So if we look at the basic Arab social contract, the Arab social contract is made up of, uh, particularly in oil producing countries, is that we will mute our concerns okay, in terms of political enfranchisement. However, you as a government are going to act as a redistributive mechanism or instrument to be able to uh, give us uh, 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 revenue or to redistribute revenue to the people. Okay, And this has more or less uh, been quite stable, at least for the past several decades within many of the countries, but it started to fall apart. But when we look at uh, this model of subsidization, okay, the, the subsidy model, which is inherent within this, within Egypt it's bread subsidies, but within the Gulf it's access to low energy, low energy, uh, low cost energy, and so on, low priced energy, is that uh, the people view this as being part and parcel of their social contracts. So when you start to see the rise of interest politics within the Gulf, I think that you're going to start to have uh, politicians or so on start to cater to the needs of their people. And one of the ways that they're going to do this is by simply saying that I will be the one who will give you the most, uh, let's say, the most money 
or the most access to, to certain uh, resources or that uh, I will give you free medical care and so on and so forth. So we could actually see uh, the subsidies begin to strain uh, these economies much more. And then if, if we look at how the Gulf countries reacted uh, in terms of the Arab Spring, uh, in terms of the protests, uh, I have the figures right here. Uh, uh, King Abdullah, for instance, he announced $37 billion uh, uh, increase in pay raises in order to meet these pressures, uh, unemployment checks and also other benefits. Uh, Hamid bin Isa al Khalifa of Bahrain, he offered 1,000 dinars, which is more or less about uh, 2,500 or $600 for each family, although this still did not really quell the protests. And uh, the Sultan of Oman also announced that uh, anyone jobless would have a monthly stipend of about $375. And then in addition to that, the GCC as an entity uh, pledged about $20 billion worth of subsidies to shore up uh, Bahrain and Oman. So we see that one of the ways to attempt to meet these protests are increasing subsidies, not less so. So this is the trend that I see for these countries. So uh, one of the things that's going to be necessary uh, for these states uh, in order to meet the demands of their populaces and so on is to increase their fiscal take. So just over the past uh, few months, uh, we can see that with the uh, subsidies that Saudi Arabia has announced, uh, they have set their uh, economic target in terms of uh, what they base their, their revenue on in terms of uh, the price of the barrel of oil. I, I think that beforehand it was like it was a conservative estimate of about 50 or $60 or something along those lines. Now they've increased this to about $80. Okay, so this, we can see that now they are really moving close to the edge and this subsidization model is burdening the economy. And I expect to see much more of this, and I expect that if the people have more of a voice, they're going to demand much more of this revenue flowing towards them, and then we're going to see this push for the governments for more of a fiscal take. And then, of course, this would be aligned in line with what you said before. There might be less investment. You might see Zenosi you know, acting in much more of a socially, um, a social manner, uh, for instance, providing much more jobs and, and, uh, and not investing as much as they should in certain oil goods. So there could be a future uh, decrease in terms of oil production outside of OPEC even. And, and, uh, also, and with that, I think we'll, uh, we have to wrap it up here. Thank you very much, Justin, for a very good well. <laughs> But also, I mean, so this incentivizes uh, from lowering the prices of the barrel. Yes, yes, that's absolutely correct. <laughs> Yeah, so they're going to want to be, uh, increase the price as much as possible. And this morning, the Saudi, Saudi dropped their quota. Oh, uh, yeah, they did? Yes, yeah. this morning. And I noticed that, it's cracked $4 around here. Mm, yes, yes. Just yes, although the gas market's...